cannot explain. But advances in technology have led to new theories, and the search is underway for evidence that may unlock the most baffling questions of our time. On Mystery Quest. Solitary confinement, a mattress, and four bare walls. Reserved for the worst offenders. But one prisoner can't move. He's dead. With mysterious marks around his neck. Help here! Little help! Who or what killed this man inside America's most secure prison? Alcatraz, this barren, windswept island in San Francisco Bay is home to America's first supermax prison, and it's always had a sinister reputation. The name Alcatraz invokes images of brutality, violence, and insanity. As far back as the 1400s, Native American legend claimed it was inhabited by evil spirits. Alcatraz became a federal penitentiary in 1934 and soon got its nickname, The Rock. Tales of torture began almost immediately and this 22-acre island was off in the end of the line. The prison's people said, well, we've got to have something that's going to hold people who are this violent. So they looked around and said, what do we have? The prison guards were handpicked, the toughest of the tough from around the nation. Inmates were allowed one visitor a month at the warden's sole discretion. The concrete cells measured only five by nine feet. Inmates weren't often allowed to speak. The loneliness driving many insane. Alcatraz was a last resort. This is the place that you came when they couldn't handle you they decided this was the place that was going to handle you for good. Official records are imprecise, but 64 men are said to have died, either behind these bars or trying to escape them. When inmates began committing suicide, using any means available, rumors started to circulate that the prison was haunted. Some guards began to think solitary confinement, called the hole, was the residence of evil. Today, night watchmen tell of the sounds of inmates running and of hearing Al Capone playing the banjo. Now, Mystery Quest will travel to the island and investigate these mysterious happenings. The science team will search for evidence of paranormal activity. I'm hearing um, words. They're. Um crying for mercy. To do this, they'll use a variety of highly sensitive state-of-the-art equipment to record overnight activity on the island. This recording is basically a sound recording of speech. And the expedition team will investigate the only reputedly successful escape from Alcatraz. 
This is the place nobody leaves, and they left it. They'll examine the route the escapees would have taken and whether they could have survived the frigid waters. And Mystery Quest will also reveal what the escapees would look like today if they managed to survive. Alcatraz was America's most notorious and inescapable prison for three decades. But in 1962, three inmates, Frank Morris and John and Clarence Anglin, decided to test this reputation. One legend of Alcatraz that had never been per pierced was the fact that it was impassable. No one could get off the island. Suddenly, the largest manhunt in 30 years was underway. This escape was phenomenal. After World War II, this is the biggest thing that hit the news. Frank Ahern is a skip tracer, finding those who don't want to be found. He will be leading the Mystery Quest expedition. He has spent years researching the Alcatraz escape, one of 14 escape attempts in the prison's history. Of the 36 prisoners who risked their lives to get off the island, 23 were quickly recaptured. Six were gunned down by guards before they got to the water. Two drowned and their bodies were recovered, while two others are listed as missing and presumed drowned. As much as hope tended to die when people reached Alcatraz, one hope that they had was that they could get off. A guy would see a moment where he could sprint for freedom and it would be impulsive. And a guard would say, stop or I'll shoot. And he wouldn't stop and they would shoot. And that would be it. And then you would have those the way they planned for months. Convicted bank robbers, Morris and the Anglin brothers, spent six months preparing their breakout. Each man had a job in a workshop, giving them access to everything they needed. These guys were smart. What they did was they used tools around them to make the escape. They made rafts and life preservers from stolen raincoats and came up with a clever way to cover their tracks. So when the guards came by, they had to have realistic devices in the bed that looked like they were sleeping. The prisoners painted paper mache heads to leave in their beds, and they tunneled through their cell walls with relative ease. The prison had been built 20-some years before, and the salt water that was going in through the prison walls and through the plumbing was eroding the concrete. Actually, the guards themselves were very surprised that it was easy to dig through with small spoons and tools of that nature. On June 11, 1962, Morris and the Anglins slipped through their cell walls and began climbing up a utility shaft. And they just made their way up, up, up. And the final thing that they had to go for was the metal air vent on the top that was like a wagon wheel. Next, they crossed the roof and shimmied down a drain pipe to reach the ground. They got to the water and they put their flotation devices together from the raincoats and basically sailed away. Frank Ahern believes the three escapees would have headed for Angel Island, two miles across the bay. But it wouldn't have been easy. The bay's waters are frigid. The average June water temperature is just 52 degrees. The tides are also treacherous, and the bay is trafficked by dozens of ships daily. Additionally, the escape took place at night, making the swim far more dangerous. But Ahern says his research led him to believe none of these factors would have come into play. Robert Anglin, the brother, told me when they heard about the escape on the news and they were talking about the, uh, the flotation devices, the family laughed because they knew that the brothers didn't need that. They were such strong swimmers. Yet even strong swimmers might not be able to overcome nature. A grown man would start experiencing the early symptoms of hypothermia probably in the first half an hour. Mystery Quest is investigating Alcatraz, one of the most ominous and forbidding places in American history. The Spanish explorer who named Alcatraz in 1775, Juan Manuel de Ayala, found the island so inhospitable he never set foot on it. 
In the 1800s, the U.S. military erected a lighthouse, a fort, and a jail on the island. The first inmates were hardcore Confederate prisoners from the Civil War, some of whom died as a result of the deplorable conditions there. Decades later, in the 1930s, a new kind of criminal. Gangsters were ruling the nation's streets, and authorities needed a place to put them. They transferred some of the most evil men in America to Alcatraz. One of the most famous was convicted murderer Robert Stroud, who became known as the Birdman of Alcatraz. He remained a violent inmate, but in prison he grew fascinated by birds, eventually raising some 300 in his cell. He even wrote two books on the subject. Gangster Al Capone went from public enemy number one to inmate 85 on Alcatraz. In solitary, Capone began a physical and mental decline from which he never recovered. And racketeer James J. Whitey Bulger, currently a fugitive on the FBI's 10 most wanted list, also served time on the rock. I think that you really could say the men weren't hardened by being here, they were softened. Al Capone, who had lived high off the hog in every other place that he had been, basically came here and eventually, after a few months, said to the warden, Warden, I guess Alcatraz has got me licked. Life on the island was so harsh that self-mutilations and suicides weren't uncommon. One of the famous stories is the story of uh, Ruth Percival, who one day just lost it. He chopped off the fingers of one hand and then held out the hatchet to another inmate and said, chop off the fingers of my other hand. By the early 1960s, critics were calling conditions on Alcatraz cruel and inhuman. In March of 1963, the Federal Bureau of Prisons shut Alcatraz down. But the reports of ghostly apparitions here never stopped. The Mystery Quest science team is traveling to Alcatraz to search for evidence of hauntings. Tom Netzband, a San Francisco ghost hunter, leads the group which will spend the night on the island. Psychic Carla Barron has been called in to help choose where the team should focus their investigation. Netzband walks her through Alcatraz, searching for paranormal hotspots. To help identify the areas, they key in on pockets of extreme temperature change. Normally, I'll get cold because spirits join with me for the warmth. They, they join with me for the life force. Baron believes a spirit can drain energy from a room, lowering its temperature. I'll register the cold even before a thermometer or some sort of measuring device will measure the cold. Very cold, like, uh, feel my hands. Ice cold. Jeez, <laughs> oh, oh my God. Just all of a sudden, right here. They want to show me something. Hold on. They want to show me something. Baron leads Nets Band straight to the most dreaded area in Alcatraz. D-block. Solitary confinement. They're bringing me somewhere. What? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Here, here. Okay. <laughs> here. Ah. What is this? This is the hole. This is what they would call the hole. So prisoners would be locked in these uh, okay. pitch black cells, sometimes for weeks. She reaches the last of the cells. Ah, cold. Number 14. Really cold. This cell was said to be where an inmate was murdered by an unseen intruder. Giving up hope. I get giving up hope in here. Just 
just such a feeling of despair. There's no hope. It's like buried alive. It's like I'm buried alive in here. Baron is drawn from D block to another notorious area of the prison, the hospital. What's going on here? <gasps> ah. Oof. Oh, oh, again? oh, 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 yeah. Ah. You okay? Yeah, that was weird. I felt like somebody stabbed me in the back almost. Wow. Like, like, We're um, gonna definitely set up some equipment in here then. Mm, fight, um, fight, fight, riot, riot, fight, fight, fighting, fighting, rioting, uh, many, many, not well, just, just one. A, I just got a spike over here. Whoa. Too, so. Cold. Oh, God. Oh, Next man. band again begins to register a drop in the room's temperature. 64.5. Blood. I'm seeing blood. 62.9. Mm. 62.4. 61.3. There's something to be known here. There's something. There's something we don't know yet. There's a secret. Baron chooses D Block and the hospital to become the focus of the investigation. The team has come armed with a broad spectrum of paranormal equipment, including night vision and infrared cameras, portable audio recorders, and two unique devices. One is called an ovalus, which converts energy into speech. Gouge and the other, the paranormal puck, which is more specialized. The user can type in questions, and the answers are seen, heard, and saved. R. R. The team unexpectedly gets its first piece of evidence, recording an EVP, or electronic voice phenomenon, in the hospital. Hey, guys. Hey. You know, I think I caught something already. Okay. In the hydrotherapy room there. Right. Listen. Ghost hunters say EVP recordings are spirits attempting to communicate from beyond the grave. This recording is an important piece of evidence that will be analyzed later. The teams pair off. They'll spend the next hour setting up their equipment. Nets band assigns Sister Sharon and Anne Leong to the hospital wing. He and Shauna Sinclair will work down in D block. All right, we're gonna roll. So there it goes. You wanna start in 14? Ready. Let's go in. Pain. Jolt. Energy. Is there anyone here? I'm starting to get a little bit of a headache in here. They head to another area. So this is where we want to go. Is there anything in this prison that wants to communicate with us? So I get this really weird feeling, like I'm being watched or something. You know? Yeah, I get that feeling too. Did you see that? What'd you see? It just looked like I saw somebody walk past there. Hello? 
The investigation into whether Alcatraz was truly escape-proof is focusing on the swim Frank Morris and Clarence and John Anglin may have made. It is known the men entered San Francisco Bay sometime during the night of June 11, 1962. They would have battled strong currents, heavy ship traffic, and hypothermia, a dangerously low body temperature. The average June water temperature in the bay is between 51 and 54 degrees Fahrenheit. The channel between Alcatraz and Angel Island is two miles wide, and it would have taken more than an hour to cover the distance. A grown man would start experiencing the early symptoms of hypothermia probably in the first half an hour. Hands become numb. Uncontrollable shivering begins. As blood vessels constrict, muscles cramp and are hard to coordinate. In advanced hypothermia, the victim becomes incoherent and major organs fail. They could survive for one to two hours before it became so advanced that they could no longer make a concentrated effort at trying to survive. Even if they reached Angel Island, they would not have been home free. Had they made it to Angel Island with advanced hypothermia, without medical care, they probably would not have been able to live more than one day. The subsequent investigation turned up some evidence on this beach. This is Angel Island, OK? One of the possibilities of where the Anglins and Mars could have ended up, where I believe that some of Clarence Anglin's belongings washed up there were pictures of family members. There was a small phone book with contact information. And the FBI believed that because they located that, that they may have drowned. Mystery Quest is on Alcatraz, searching for answers to the island's enduring mysteries. Half the science team is in the hospital's wardroom, recording audio and trying to capture the sound of a spirit. Can you tell us your names? This was an area targeted as having the strongest psychic aura. If there's anyone out here, can you please let us know who you are? How many of you are here? They decide to attempt contact with one of the prison's most famous inmates, Al Capone. Capone was transferred to Alcatraz in 1934. To help pass the time, he played the banjo. It's been reported that a banjo has been heard echoing through the now deserted prison ever since. Hey, Al Capone, if you're here, I hear that you play a mean banjo. It'd be my honor if you could play a few bars for us, Mr. Capone. Let's hear some banjo music. The sisters head towards the hospital room where Robert Stroud, the birdman of Alcatraz, spent 11 of his 17 years in the prison. Okay, so this is Robert Stroud's cell. You have the trigger objects? Mm-hmm. Okay. The Leongs have small plastic birds that contain a motion and light sensor just under their beak. See, the sensor is down here. When triggered, they sing. The sounds are actual recordings of birds Stroud would have known. A blue parakeet, an American goldfinch, and the northern sawwet owl. If the birds react while everyone is still, they may be registering Stroud's presence. The 
owl. That's weird. You're not even standing near the owl. No, I'm not. And you're in front. Are you standing by the owl, Robert? That's an owl. Can you say something? Thank you. Neither sister was standing in front of the owl. The team downstairs is trying to capture a presence that may be invisible to the naked eye, using a camera that can see in the dark. It is an industrial grade FLIR, or forward looking infrared camera. The FLIR registers heat signatures orange or yellow, a warm object, blue or purple, a colder one. So let's go back into 14, because that seems to be where all the activity is. There we go. Is there a presence in the cell that would like to communicate with us? There's a little bit of a... A registry, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a little blue, like a little bluer sort of on that wall, but it's not much. The results are inconclusive. Next, the teams switch places. The Leong sisters head down to D-Block. Netsband and Sinclair to the hospital. They will only discuss what they have found after the observation period has ended. Validation is a very, very serious point to us. And in order to do that, we can't discuss things with one another until both teams have been in the actual area. And then we'll compare. And if both of us are experiencing the same thing, we're further validating what's going on here. Netsband begins his investigation upstairs using the flare. All right. All right. I just heard something in here. Me too. Like a shuffling. Is anyone in this room? Did you hear that shuffling in here? Yeah. It was like... Yeah. I heard that. When Frank Morris and Clarence and John Anglin were discovered missing, the FBI was called in and bloodhounds put on the case. But they lost the men sent at the water's edge. The authorities got a break in the case when another inmate admitted he was supposed to be in on the plan, but was left behind. He said after reaching Angel Island, the escapees were going to swim across to Marin County, then steal a car and civilian clothing. The FBI just figured these guys would get picked up in like two days from, from, from the escape. But no thefts were reported in Marin. Everything law enforcement expected just never took place. A month later, Morris and the Anglin brothers were listed as missing and presumed drowned. I think it was important for law enforcement to kind of shut this thing down quick because they want to make sure that the, the image of Alcatraz being this imposing place where nobody could escape from, that if you escaped from here, you would just drown. But Ahern doesn't think the men drowned. And he doubts they had to swim all the way to Angel Island. He believes they had a boat waiting to pick them up. So my theory basically is that this was such a sophisticated escape that by no means when they got out, they were just going to wing it. They were definitely looking for a specific plan. And that plan most likely included having the boat. There was a report of a mysterious boat in the area on the night of the escape, but authorities were never able to track it down. The three convicts had disappeared without a trace. And if the men are still alive, Mystery Quest will investigate what they would look like today.
Mystery Quest is investigating Alcatraz, its haunting, and the possible 1962 escape from the Escape Proof prison. Frank Morris and Clarence and John Anglin had disappeared. Prison officials listed the men as presumed drowned, but authorities never stopped looking. Over the years, sightings of the men filtered in from all over North America, but those leads proved dead ends. Then in the late 1980s, the U.S. Marshals, following up on another lead, brought in one of Clarence and John Anglin's brothers from Florida for a polygraph test. They brought Robert Anglin, the brother to Clarence and J.W. in for a polygraph test somewhere around 12 and 15 years ago. It tells me that law enforcement must know something that they would bring the brother, Robert Anglin, in 25 years later if there wasn't something beyond what we know. The results were never released, and the case remains open today. Could the men be alive more than four decades later? Frank Morris was 35 when he disappeared. He would be 83 years old now. By using a process called digital age progression, we can assume he would look something like this. Clarence Anglin was 31. He would be 79. His brother John Anglin was 32 and would be 80. Age progression is, is a great tool for law enforcement because it does identify what they would look like now. But the key is getting that photo to places where they may be. The Leong sisters are headed to solitary confinement. Let's go look at cell block D. Okay. They will be using a new device, the Paranormal Puck. With it, the user can type in questions and the answers are seen as well as heard and saved. They decide to investigate cell 14, where an inmate was reported to have been found mysteriously murdered. Okay, I'm gonna put the puck back in. Ann Leong stops at the door. There's something repulsive about the smell of this room. I'm going to just stay up. I'm going to ask it a question. I'm going to ask who's here. Dinner. Human. Human. Waste. Human waste. Why can't I go inside? OK. Why can't Anne come in here? So there's no response? No, not to that question. Hmm. Strange. Tom Netsband and Shona Sinclair are in the hospital's pharmacy. You can still smell the medicine. Smell it? Getting cold again? Yeah. Let's do some temperature readings. It's about 65 degrees in here. The temperature begins to drop. 62.4, Can you drop the temperature to say 58 degrees? 60.4, 59.8. Come on, 58 degrees. If you're here, drop it lower, please. 59.3, 58.8, 58.6. You're almost there, come on. 58.5, 58.3, 58.1. bring it down. It's a little bit more, 57.9. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. They know you're here. The drop happened in just minutes.
Are you getting that chill again? Yeah, I just get this chill running through my body, like right around here. Like it's very like, uncomfortable. Huh? It's touching me. It's touching it's me. Touching it's touching you? me. It's here again. Where are you getting touched? I'm getting touched in my hair right here. There are times when Netsband actually feels the presence of a spirit, and it's happening to him right now. I'm telling you, I yeah. feel it. It's it's running down my neck here like this. I feel like fingers on my, like fingers down. Oh, I don't like that feeling. I just don't like it, you know? I'm freaking out. I've never, ever felt that where it's been so intense like that. Ah, there's that kidney pain again. What the hell? Who's up here? Ah, that hurts. I don't like this ward cell. I don't like it at all. This is the creepiest room to me in this whole hospital. Let's just get out of here. I'm not getting stabbed again. Netsband decides to wrap the investigation. All right, I think we're going to wrap it up and call it a night. OK. The cameras have shot hours of footage, which must now be analyzed. Images from the infrared still cameras, data from the puck, and the audio recordings will be downloaded and reviewed. This is a sound that is not from uh, uh, the speech of a human being. In fact, it's impossible to produce that. Mystery Quest is investigating the most notorious prison in U.S. history, Alcatraz. This skip tracer believes, despite its reputation as inescapable, there was one successful escape from the island. The psychic believes the prison is haunted by the ghosts of inmates who suffered or died here. And this investigator believes he encountered several of those spirits during his team's overnight expedition in the prison. The disappearance of Frank Morris and Clarence and John Anglin remains an open case. Frank Ahern believes authorities aren't looking in the right place, based partly on a clue found in a cell back on Alcatraz. A map was located and Mexico and Canada pages were ripped out. And back then the borders weren't as tight. And they had timed their escape with precision. They chose to go over the wall after the very last head count because they knew that there would not be another head count until 7 o'clock the following morning. So they had about 10 hours before any of the guards looked for them. Which gave them plenty of time to make a run for the border. Sometime later, the Anglin's mother was said to have received a postcard from one of her sons from Brazil. Ahern believes the three fugitives headed there because at the time, the U.S. had no extradition treaty with Brazil. And the marshals went down there, and this is going back about probably 12, 15 years ago, and a bartender in Brazil identified one of the brothers as living in the area. And the marshals set up shop there for quite some time. However, they just never located the brothers. Ahern is sure they never will. I definitely believe that they got away. I think that uh, they beat it. This is the place nobody leaves and Anglins and Morris left it. The science team gathered important evidence, including hours of video from nearly a dozen cameras, data from the paranormal puck, digital images from infrared still cameras, and audio recordings. Now, Mystery Quest is examining the results. The prison's hospital appeared to provide the most paranormal activity. In the pharmacy, Netsband recorded a steep temperature drop on his ambient temperature meter. And we actually were using it to communicate with the spirits and asking them, can you drop the temperature to, say, 58 degrees? 
and slowly it continued to drop, drop, wow. drop. Right in front of our eyes. Right in front oh of our God. eyes. Now keep in mind the same thing happened with Carla. Uh, she physically she felt physically it drop. felt it, but I definitely was able to validate that the temperature was dropping in the hospital oh, wow. on two different occasions. In the hospital's ward, Netsband actually felt a spirit touch him, and the team wanted to review the moment. But though his colleague's night vision camera was clearly on, and so was the record light, this section of tape was mysteriously blank. The group moves on to evidence from the motion-sensitive birds left in the Birdman cell. So, here we're trying to test the birds to see uh, where we're walking across and front. And it's really funny, but Sharon never once went past the owl. And when you can see the video clip here, the owl was just hooting. So that's amazing. I think that's pretty that's cool. Great. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess if you really want to contact Robert Stroud, then you would bring some birds. The team also recorded various EVPs, or electronic voice phenomena. I went into the hydrotherapy room, and remember, I, I played it for you. What do you think it said? Hmm. Bless you. One more time. I love you. I love you. Yeah, yeah that's what I hear, too. This recording, along with several others, was sent to Paul Ginsberg, a forensic audio analyst. Now, this is called a time domain waveform, where we see the actual wave itself, the sound. It's a pictorial representation. Ginsberg works with the CIA and FBI, examining audio evidence and providing expert testimony. And from left to right, we have time. And when there's something loud, it will have these larger excursions than when it's low. After we have normal speech, there is a burst of energy. And this is a sound that is not from uh, uh, the speech of a human being. In fact, it's impossible to produce that. There do seem to be words spoken and not by a human. The team has another EVP that was captured in the wardroom. They asked, how many of you are here? Wow. wow. 50 more or less? I hear 50 just about. Yeah. You hear it again? Yeah. Look at How many are you? Fifty, more or less. I mean, you can clearly hear fifty. These sounds are well above the range of the human voice spectrum. So I would say, without any question, that those sounds were not made, could not be made by any human, at least not a live one. I would love to have some hard evidence that this, in fact, is a connection to the beyond and that there are other worlds out there. But right now, I'm uh, still skeptical. The Mystery Quest investigation has turned up some important data. The expedition team has determined that it is possible for a strong swimmer to make it to Angel Island in about one hour. This means escapees Frank Morris and Clarence and John Anglin could have survived the hypothermia-inducing cold water of San Francisco Bay. The Mystery Quest science team gathered data that seemed to indicate there is some sort of non-human entity on the island. While the mystery of this place endures, this investigation has brought us closer to understanding notorious Alcatraz Island. People came here and, and hope died, and it makes total sense to me that an island like this would hold a reserve of energy that's, that's ugly and, and evil and, and frightening.